families and APS students. Welcome to At Home with APS. We are so happy you've joined us this week and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Mosley and I'm a reading specialist at Dr. Charles R. Drew Elementary School. And today we're going to do some phonemic awareness activities together. You don't need anything except for your hands, your ears, and your voice. So what we're going to do is first we're going to blend some sounds together. I'm going to give you the first the sounds of a word and I'm going to chop them up. And your job is to say them all together. Let me do the first one for you. So let's say I said permission. Then you would say permission. Permission and blend it all together. Now it's your turn to try. Outrageous. 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 Good job. Explanation. Ex Explanation. Explanation. Good job. That was a long one. Electricity. 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 That one was hard. Good work. Personal. Personal. No. Let's try that one again. Personal. Your turn. Personal. Personal. Good job. Next one. Intelligence. 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 Good job. Last one. Tomatoes. 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 Good work. Now that we've blended sounds together, it's your job to chop the sounds apart. I'm going to give you the word and then you chop it apart. So let me try first. Discover. And then you would say discover. Discover. All right, now let's try it. Submarine. 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 Good work. Calculator. 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 Good work. Explosion. 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 Invasion. 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 Infection. 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 Last one. Alphabet. 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 Excellent job doing phonemic, acti phonemic awareness activities with me, me today. I hope to see you next time. Bye. Hi, APS families. My name is Mrs. Bokitas. I'm a second grade teacher at Nottingham Elementary. And today I'm going to read to you the book, Brad Needs a Budget. Brad Needs a Budget, written by Ned Jensen. So first we have our table of contents, money trouble, time for a budget, making a budget, spending within a budget, and our glossary. Money trouble. Every week, Brad's parents gave him an allowance. They didn't give him the money as a gift though. Brad actually earned it. Each day, Brad took out the trash and cleared the table after dinner. He fed the family dog and took him for walks. For all of this work, Brad earned $12 each week. The problem was, the money Brad earned seemed to disappear just as quickly as he earned it. His dad said that the money seemed to burn a hole in his pocket. Brad spent his money on video games more than anything else. Sometimes he wanted to go to the movies with a friend or buy a candy bar. He never seemed to have enough money though. Time for a budget. Brad begged his parents for a raise, but he didn't get one. 
Brad's dad said he would only get a raise if he did more work. Brad didn't want to do more work, so he had to get by on $12 a week. If you don't want to do more work, then I think you should create a budget, said Brad's dad. What's a budget? asked Brad. Brad's dad explained that a budget was a plan to set aside money each week for certain expenses. You spend only as much as your budget allows for each type of expense. That way, you are sure to have money for the different things you want, explained his dad. Sounds like a good idea, said Brad. Will you help me make one? Making a budget. That night, Brad sat down at the kitchen table with his parents. They made a list of the different types of things Brad wanted to be able to buy. The list included categories such as snacks, entertainment, and clothing. Brad's parents explained that a budget should always set aside a percentage of earnings as savings. They told Brad that by saving a little money each week, he could save a lot over time. Then he would be able to buy something expensive in the future. It can also be your rainy day fund, said his mom. Brad gave her a puzzled look. A rainy day fund is there to help out in an emergency, she explained. It's like an umbrella that keeps you from getting soaked if it rains. They also said it was important to set aside a little money to help others. They even offered to raise his allowance by $3 a week if he would put aside $2 for charity. Brad quickly accepted their generous offer. Spending within a budget. From that day on, Brad always seemed to have enough money to do the things he wanted. Money no longer burned a hole in his pocket. At the end of every year, he sat down with his parents. They helped him choose which charity would get the $104 he had set aside. The first year, he chose to give the money to the town's animal shelter. Giving money to help those in need made Brad feel good. He also used some of his savings to buy a cool new video game console. That made him feel good too. So these are the glossary words that you may have noticed in the text were bolded, um, and they're important in our understanding of what is going on in the book. So our first glossary word is allowance, and some of you guys might already be getting an allowance and familiar with this word, um, but it's the sum of money given out on a regular basis. So Brad earned his allowance by doing different chores, by taking care of the dog, by cleaning, um, and he got his $12 a week. A budget is a plan for how to spend money for a set period of time. So Brad set aside a budget, so how much money he wanted to save each week so that after a year, he would have extra money to spend on something really big and exciting, like his video, new video game console. Um, a charity is an organization that accepts donations of money, goods, or services, and uses them to help those in need. So Brad ended up saving $104 over the whole year that he could choose to send to a different charity. So he donated it to the local animal shelter. Expenses, that's the amount of money spent to pay for or buy something, or something on which money is spent. So that's really where you're spending all of your money. So. Brad would spend it on a video game console, or he would spend it on going to the movies or a candy bar. Um, a raise is an increase in pay. And then savings is money kept or stored for future use. So Brad used all of these different budgeting tools um, to save money so that he could spend it on something that he really enjoyed and also to donate it to charity. So I challenge you guys to come up with your own budget for maybe the month. We'll start small and think about how you could donate to charity or something that you'd like to save your money on um, for a big spending purchase at the end of the year.
Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Trainer. I am a resource teacher for the Gifted at McKinley Elementary School here in Arlington Public Schools. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope this video finds you and your family well. A very quick recap of our story, Brad Needs a Budget. In this story, Brad needs a budget. He learns that uh, there are a lot of things he wants to buy in the world, and in order to purchase those things, he can't spend money as soon as he gets it. Uh, in my family growing up, my dad used to say that I had a case of the I wants, where I would go to a toy store and say, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and soon enough, I realized that if I spent everything, in, uh, if I spent all my money as soon as I got it, I really couldn't save up for anything big. And this is a story that Brad's parents try to convey to him and help him understand the value of setting a budget when it comes to spending his money. As I already mentioned, there were a lot of connections that I made to this story. I mentioned that my dad used to call it a case of the I wants whenever I wanted to spend something, but the thing that I remember most about being a kid was the pair of shoes you see kind of above me right here. They were a pair of blue Chuck Taylor or Converse high tops that I absolutely wanted. They were uh, the shoes at, I wanted the most as a sixth grader, if I recall correctly. And I had to figure out a way to get them because my parents didn't want to spend uh, extra money on a pair of shoes because they already bought me one, so I had to save up for it. And I did everything that I could possibly think of. And you can see some of the pictures um, of the things that Brad was trying to do. I was trying to take out the trash. I was trying to do all of the dishes. I think I was even trying to help cook. We didn't have a dog, so I couldn't walk the dog, but I tried everything I could to get those shoes. And when I finally saved up enough money to get the shoes, you know what happened? They were out of stock. I couldn't get them. So I got a different pair of shoes that were red and black. They were called Airwalks. I still remember it. They were really cool, but they weren't the shoes that I wanted. But I learned, even though I didn't get the shoes that I wanted, there's a lot of value in having a budget and learning how to save up for something you really, really want. For this week's strategy, we're going to share something called a morphological matrix, which is sort of, I think, the most difficult to say of the strategies, but in my opinion, it's the most fun to use. It's a strategy that we use to help us generate lots and lots of ideas. So what exactly is this really complicated sounding strategy? Well, it involves a matrix and stated as simply as possible, uh, I think of a matrix as sort of like a table. It's got some rows, it's got some columns, and we use those rows and columns to generate lots of ideas. And so you can see in the story, Brad sort of made a table to figure out all of the things that he wanted to spend his money on. You can see that there are three rows at the top. So it's got things I want to have more money for, a weekly budget and then a yearly budget. And then coming down that first column, you can see that he wants to have money for snacks, entertainment, and then he's kind of covering up his third item on the, on the list. But you can see how he's gonna keep those ideas organized by putting them in, in rows and columns. And we're gonna do the same thing in just a moment. Okay, so I mentioned that a matrix is a lot like a table, and we're gonna use this table to start our project. And you can see on this slide, there's a picture of a piggy bank. And that is because our project is going to involve designing our own homemade piggy bank. And we're gonna use this table, this morphological matrix to do it. And we'll talk about what you need here in just a moment. And we've talked a lot about the fact that this strategy sounds very complicated. In reality, it's pretty simple. And you don't really need a lot of complicated stuff to use the strategy. I showed a picture of like a clipboard with some paper, a pencil, and a ruler. If you wanna keep your lines really, really straight, you could use the ruler. You don't need to, but we're going to make rows and columns with pencil on a piece of paper. Pretty simple, and we're gonna use it to get started on our project. So take a moment, see if you can track down a pencil and see if you can track down something to write on. Maybe if you have a big piece of paper, like a piece of construction paper, that would also be a good idea, depending on how big your letters are when you write them. The bigger the boxes that you make, the easier it is for you to write those words inside them. All right, above my head there, you can see that I've created a model of a matrix table, okay? And as I'm talking, what I would like you to do with your pencil and your paper, and maybe your ruler, if you like, to make straight lines, is to create a table that looks like mine. Now, you don't need to have yellow, green, blue, and orange headings, but the materials that we're gonna use, or the labels that we're gonna use, excuse me, should be the same. So in that first column, I would like you to write down piggy bank materials, and then you can kind of draw a line, and if you have lined paper, you don't need to draw those lines to make the rows, because the lines in the paper will do it for you. Uh, second column is going to be about the craft supplies we're gonna add to our matrix. Then we're gonna make a list of ideas that go along with the decorations. And then lastly, we'll talk about shape, okay? So I'm gonna give you just a moment to kind of make that table or at least get started with that first column, the piggy bank materials. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the things that we could make a piggy bank out of. All right, so go ahead, I'll give you like five more seconds to just get started on those drawings. 
Okay. I think I said we're going to start on drawings. We're not starting on drawings. We're just going to add a list of items. Now, piggy banks usually hold coins, but I know it's not always the case that you have a lot of coins lying around your house. I know that after, um, sometimes my son will bring some change to the bank and he'll get like actual paper money for it. We don't have any coins. So I was thinking that you could put lots of different things in your piggy bank. Um, sometimes what we do is we, we take uh, little pieces of paper, like sticky notes, and we put things about like our day, just love a daily reflection, like I wish this would have gone better, or this was the highlight of my day. And then after you have filled up the piggy bank with all those paper things, it's fun to look back and say, oh, on May 14th, um, I was really excited because I got a package in the mail from my cousin or whatever it might be. Okay, so if you don't have coins, you can still make the piggy bank. All right, so what are we gonna make about piggy bank materials? Take a moment and think, all right, what could I build a container out of? Or what containers can I already, or might I already have that I could just reuse for the piggy bank? All right, so think, um, I'm gonna think about, like we have one in our house, it's uh, it's made out of a coconut, I don't, but I do not have like coconuts, nor would, do I would even begin to know how to like hollow it out. But we do have a coconut one, that wouldn't work for us. But we do have a lot of, there's actually one by my back door right now, we have a shoebox. So maybe we could make a container for our piggy bank out of a shoebox. What other things might come in boxes that we have in our house that can get empty? We wouldn't want to like make it empty on purpose if we were still using it. Um, oh, I see another one. Um, we have tissue boxes, lots of tissue boxes. Um, when they get empty, they're good containers. So I'm going to, I would think to add, so we've got two boxy things. Right? We've got uh, tissue box, shoe box, uh, other things that we could make, maybe uh, like a milk carton after it's empty, that could be a container we could use. Uh, Legos, we can totally make something out of Legos, build it up and then we could like put things inside of it. Um, what else, what else, what else? I'm thinking of things you can use with your hands. Mm. Oh, um, I know that I've seen maker spaces in the elementary schools that have modeling clay. Maybe that could be a good one. I don't know if they would dry out well enough, um, but it's worth a try, right? So those are some of the materials. We've got shoe boxes, milk jugs, tissue boxes. Oh, like a coffee can, that could work too. So if we wrote down each of those things inside that table, we'd be in pretty good shape, okay? Now on the next part of the video, I'm gonna have like a completed version of this so you can kind of go back and um, remember the things that I talked about. So don't worry about writing them down super fast. All right, supplies. These are the things that we need like, you know, in, in your maker space, if you have one of those at school or an art class that you just use or at your desk if you're doing stuff. Um, things like, uh, what do we cut with? Scissors, okay. Um, if we're cutting things, we wanna like attach it to the can, we might need what? Tape, uh, glue, that would probably work. Um, what if you want to add some like paint? We would need like those supplies, right? Like paint, um, brushes, we'd probably need those. Um, construction paper, that could be another thing. Uh, oh, and this is, I, I, I just thought of this one because uh, my daughter watches a lot of Peppa Pig and uh, there are a lot of episodes where they use glitter and it's like a big thing. So you could add glitter as a material. So that would be one of our craft supplies. And again, I'm gonna fill this table out. And so when you see it on the next part of the video, um, you can look at it and say like, all right, these are the things that uh, we talked about. All right, decorations. What could we decorate it with? Um, paint, we talked about that. Um, your drawings, if you have construction paper. Uh, what else uh, that you might have around your house? I'm trying to think of things that we have in our house. Stickers, we have those. Uh, uh, a, a, a one my son loves to add to things, especially like um, when he makes like cupcakes, if he ever makes cupcakes. He liked to add like little like edible googly eyes to them, like those little candy googly eyes. We have some sticker ones that I think we got from a craft store. Um, pipe cleaners, that could work. You could decorate, give it like arms or something like that. Uh, what else? Sometimes they'll have like little styrofoam balls. I don't know if they would attach, but maybe they would. So if you think about all the different uh, decorations that you could add, those are just a few of them. And then the last one, and this is sort of like my favorite part of this whole project, is what is the shape of our um, piggy bank going to be. Now, if it's a tissue box or it's a shoe box, it's going to be sort of like a rectangular prism, okay, um, which is like a box shape. Um, depending on your tissue box, it could be like a cube, all right? Uh, that one, the cube, I was thinking about this. What might like my son want to do 
for a piggy bank, like what shape? And the cube thing made me think of Minecraft. And I thought, ooh, a Minecraft piggy bank would probably be pretty, uh, pre be pretty cool. And then I started to think about other things that um, might be fun to make. And then I thought, well, if we're building a Lego, you can sort of make anything, right? any building with Legos. But I thought it might be cool to like make an actual like bank, what looked like a bank, or um, it could be a building that has like different floors and it could be you know different shapes. Um, I thought about a pyramid that could be pretty cool, but I don't know exactly how I would do it. But that's part of the fun, right? I have no idea how it's gonna actually work. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about how all of these things are, or why it's not just called a table um, and why it's called a morphological matrix in just a second. So in the next part of the video, I'm gonna show you this completed table or something that resembles it. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how it becomes a morphological matrix. So here you see all of the different ideas that we sort of talked about just a few moments ago. And the idea of why this is different from a regular table is because it gives you an opportunity to kind of combine things in different ways so that your piggy bank takes on different forms. So let's say that you start off with a coffee can and then you decide you're gonna use a paintbrush and you're going to um, have some puff balls and you're going to make it into a tower. That, that would be one way that you could make your piggy bank. But if you say, no, I don't like that combination. Instead, I know what I wanna do. I actually wanna combine things. I wanna do a cereal box and I wanna do the coffee can and I'm going to use construction paper mostly, uh, a lot of glitter, and I'm going to make you know tower out of it. Uh, different combination. If you say, all right, I'm gonna take a shoe box and some Play-Doh and I've got a lot of googly eyes and stickers and I'm going to make a house for my Minecraft character Perfect, right? There's all sorts of different ways that you can combine these. You do not need to go straight across a row so that your piggy bank is a shoebox that you use uh, primarily by cutting things with scissors and you paint it and it's round, right? That would be really tough to do to make a shoebox turn into something round. But maybe you're like, Mr. Trainer, that is exactly what I want to do. I want to take something that's not round and turn it into something that is even better, right? So you can use these different things so that your piggy bank can take on one form or then another form and then another form and you eventually get to one that you really, really like and then you try to make it. And as we wrap up this video, we will share a quick family engagement tip around how you can use the morphological matrix in some other creative ways. The morphological matrix is one of my favorite creative tools. We use it a lot in the classroom and one of the most effective ways that we use it is with creative storytelling. So you can see that for creative stories, if you were to make your columns and at the headings, they would be characters and settings, vehicles, place, uh, ways for the characters to get places, problems they might have. Uh, and then a list of adjectives, almost like a Mad Lib. So you have some characters that might be cranky or uh, joyful, or you've got uh, a sad character, as it might be. So really great for creative stories, um, and especially great to use if you have things that you can build at home to, to make those settings, or build to make the vehicles. It just adds to the engagement of it. So if you tell a story where you've got, I don't know, um, a character from one of your favorite movies that needs to, you know, get out of the top of the lighthouse for whatever reason, I don't know why they'd be there. It just be, could be how your story turned out. Um, and you could build a plane to rescue them or a helicopter to get them out of there. That'd be super fun, it just adds to the engagement. Um, and then I also shared a picture of where the wild things are. This is a, a story that we've used at McKinley with this strategy. Uh, so we read the story and we talked about all of the different features of the animals. They had like um, you know, animal features and they had different like heads and bodies and arms, but then they also wear like different kinds of people clothes. So we created our own wild things using this strategy. The kids enjoyed it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it might be something that you enjoy as well. So thank you for tuning in and uh, I hope that you can find this strategy one that you can use while we're away doing our distance learning. Good morning, second graders. This is Miss Kaloris. I teach second grade at Discovery Elementary School, and I'm here today to show you how to complete one of the high frequency word choice board activities in your packet. So um, I want to show you the homophone art activity. So this activity, while is super fun, I'm actually gonna show you a way to put a twist on it on the end that can actually help you become a better writer. I'm so excited to show you. So for the homophone art activity, we have to start by writing out several sets of homophones. So you can see I did that with eight and eight, C and C, 
here and here and the tricky one two two and two so that one's not a pair it's a little bit of a triad right so then the activity asks you to write and to draw an illustration so for eight i drew a fork for eight i put the number eight for c i had two eyes looking for the c i, I have some waves for here i wrote an ear so you can see that for here i put like x marks a spot like you are right here where you're supposed to be for two i put the numeral two for T-O-O, -O, that is like also or as well. So I put two check marks. It reminds me of a morning meeting. When you agree with someone's idea, you can put a check mark by it to agree. And T-O-2, as in going towards something, like I'm going to the park, I thought of it as a direction. So I drew an arrow. Now, this activity is super fun. And the second part of the activity asks you to make a sentence with each word so that way you remember the meaning of it and you remember how you can spell it when you go to write. So for example, um, if I was doing eight and eight, the second part of the activity is to say the sentence. So I would do, I ate a yummy breakfast this morning. Mm. Or most of my students are eight years old. Now I'm gonna see if you can try this, okay? So can you try it for the word here? Okay, think of your sentence. Okay, go ahead, tell me. Nice, very nice, okay. And we're gonna try here, like, oh, come, come right here right now. Oh, I gave it away, oops. Okay, now you try one, I'll listen. Very nice. So this is a great way to practice, but I'm going to show you a twist. So in as writers, you know that it's super important that we can't just read these snap words, read these high frequency words, but we have to be able to write them in a snap. If we can't write them in the snap, then they're not going to help us in writing workshop. So here's my tip for you. I have my own word book. This is like my personal word wall. Do you remember we have word walls on our walls and they're those words that you can look at during writer's workshop to help remind you of spelling? Well, I suggest that you make a pocket version of that. And by pocket, I just mean smaller because you can have it for when you're writing at home, when you're writing postcards or you're writing in your journal or you're just writing creative stories for fun. So I got a head start and I went because I organized it like a dictionary in alphabetical order. And so I go to letters S and T and you'll notice something. You'll notice I've already written my homophone words. Now here's the fun twist. We drew uh, pictures here and here's the thing if there's one thing I know about second graders is that second graders love emojis mm-hmm yeah you're like oh yeah that's for me so my tip for you is for homophones in your personal word wall you should make a little emoji next to the word so you remember its meaning so we're gonna do that really quick so I have the words C and C what could I do? A quick emoji. I could, I could look to my drawing, for an example, or I can make it even simpler. This is a pretty complex drawing. What if I just drew an eyeball? Like a really quick eyeball. What do you think? Do you think that would help me remember when I go to write? Okay, how about C? I could probably replicate that, just a little bit smaller. Check it out. So now, not only have you practiced it here as like a fun activity, but now it lives forever in your personal word wall. And so you can always remember when you go to write the word, especially for the words two, two, and two, you know exactly which one to use. I had so much fun showing you this activity today, second graders, and I hope you have so much fun with it. I'll see you later. Bye. Hi, I'm Mrs. Koleski, and today we're going to read a nonfiction text about George Washington Carver. Nonfiction texts are texts or books or passages that tell a true story. The people and the events really happened in real life. In this particular book, George Washington Carver by Cynthia Kennedy Hensel, we will notice nonfiction text features, 
such as photographs, a table of contents, captions, and even a glossary. Authors include those things to help us better understand what we're reading. Before we begin, I would like you to know that George Washington Carver was an African-American scientist that was born over 150 years ago. He made a big impact on our world. Let's read to find out what George Washington Carver did to help us. The first thing you'll notice is a picture of a postage stamp. Postage stamps are used on letters or postcards when you're mailing something to someone else. I notice a microscope and even a plant on this stamp. Let's read to find out what those things symbolize. Table of Contents Born a Slave, page 4 Learning on His Own, page 6 Making a Difference, page 9 Ideas Are Free, page 13 A Lasting Message, page 15 Glossary, page 16 The first thing we notice is a photograph of George Washington Carver. Where do you think he is? I was thinking the same thing. Maybe he's in a lab doing a science project. Let's see what the caption says. George Washington Carver in the lab, 1940. The first thing I notice on this page is a map. On the top of the map, it has a title, States Where Carver Lived and Worked. So this is just one piece of a map of the United States. If I look to try and find Virginia labeled, I'm not going to find that, but I know that Virginia is over here. The states that are in yellow are the states where George Washington Carver either lived or worked. Virginia is not yellow, but Iowa, Missouri, Alabama, and Kansas are all yellow. The caption says Carver grew up in Missouri, studied in Kansas and Iowa, and worked in Alabama. Born a slave. George Washington Carver was born in Missouri in 1864 during the Civil War. Because his mother was a slave, he was born a slave too. The Civil War, 1861 through 1865. The Civil War was a fight between two sides of the United States, the North and the South. When it began, Slavery was legal in 15 slave states in the South and illegal in 17 free states in the North. After the North won the war, the slaves were freed. I see two photographs on this page. Let's take a look at the captions to learn what they are. This first photograph is the Carver home in Diamond, Missouri. The second photograph is a photograph of Moses Carver. Let's read to see if we can learn who Moses Carver was. When the Civil War ended, George became free. He stayed with the people who had owned him, Susan and Moses Carver. Susan taught George to read and write. More than anything, he liked to garden and explore the world outside. Do you think Susan Carver was a kind and caring person? Why do you think so? I also noticed the sentence that said that Susan taught George to read and write. Learning on his own. George taught himself about plants and animals. He wanted to go to school to learn more. 
In many places, black and white students could not attend the same schools. George could not go to the school nearby because he was black. When he was 12, he left home to go to another school. A year later, he left for Kansas. On the bottom, we can see a photograph with a caption that says, A School for Black Children in Kentucky. The year was 1916. What did George teach himself about? Yes, he taught himself about plants and animals. When George finished high school in Kansas, he tried to go to college there. Once he arrived, though, the college told him he had to leave. It did not allow black students. George could not attend college in Kansas because of his skin color. Why do you think it was so important to George that he go to college? He didn't give up, though. Instead, he went to college in Iowa. There, George learned all about farming. He was the first black student to finish and be, to become a professor at his college. The word professor means teacher. That's the term that teachers are given when they're teaching college students. Wow, that's a really neat accomplishment for George to be the first black student to not only finish college, but become a professor at the college he attended. George received his diploma from Iowa State Agricultural College. Making a difference. In 1896, Carver went to Alabama to help the poor farmers there. These farmers had a big problem. Their cotton crops were smaller every year, so the farmers had less money. Children helped pick cotton on a Mississippi plantation in the late 1800s. Here's a photograph of George Washington Carver. Here's what the caption says. Carver held a chunk of soil from a worn out field. Why do you think the field was worn out? I was wondering the same thing. Let's read to find out more. Carver knew that growing the same crop again and again had worn out the soil. He taught the farmers to add dead leaves and plants to the soil to help it. He also taught them to plant sweet potatoes, peas, or peanuts. These crops put things back into the soil that the plants need to grow well. So why was the soil worn out? That's right, the farmers were planting the same crop over and over, which was taking all of the nutrients out of the soil. What did George Washington Carver teach the farmers to plant to bring the nutrients back in? That's right, things like sweet potatoes, peas, or peanuts. Farmers needed a way to sell these new crops. Carver invented more than 100 ways to use sweet potatoes and more than 300 ways to use peanuts. New uses meant new products. New products meant new items for farmers to sell. Here's a photograph of Carver at work. The truth about peanut butter. Carver invented up to 300 uses for the peanut. Pavement, grease, medicines, peanut coffee, peanut mayonnaise, peanut flour, peanut milk, shoe polish, bleach, sandpaper, and more. Contrary to popular belief, however, he did not create peanut butter. A Native American tribe is known to have eaten a paste made from peanuts more than 500 years ago. It wasn't as creamy as the tasty goo we eat today, though. Ideas are free. In 1921, 
Carver was asked to speak for 10 minutes before the U.S. Congress, the country's lawmakers. Some of them didn't want him to speak because he was black. After his 10 minutes, however, they asked him to speak more. In the end, Congress passed a law to help U.S. peanut farmers. Carver spoke to members of Congress. Carver became very famous, and crowds gathered to hear him speak. He could have made lots of money, but he thought helping people was more important. He believed ideas should be free and freely given. Once Carver became famous, he met other famous men. Here he stood with Henry Ford, founder of Ford Motor Company, in 1938. A Lasting Message George Washington Carver believed that people should treat each other with respect. In time, he won the respect of a whole country. Carver also believed that people should care for the earth. If they did, earth would provide what they needed. Now, many years later, we are learning that he was right. If we look at the photograph on the top of George Washington Carver and the Institute, let's cut that part out and restart the video here. Let's look at the photo of George Washington Carver at the top and the caption below the photograph. Not long before he died, Carver donated $33,000 to the Tuskegee Institute to carry on the research he began. That would be about $450,000 today. We end our book with a glossary. The word crops means that crops are plants grown for food or other uses. The amount of plants or plant products gathered in one season. Do you remember what crops George Washington Carver told the farmers to plant to help replenish the soil? I agree, peanuts, sweet potatoes, and peas. The word famous means well-known. The word invented means created, designed, or built something that did not exist before. The word professor means a college, university, or teacher. The word slave, a person who is legally owned and completely controlled by another person. The word soil, the top layer of the ground in which plants grow. It's also called dirt. Try and remember some of the uses that George Washington Carver discovered for the peanut. Can you write about them? Welcome Arlington families. We're very excited that you could join us here for this critical and creative thinking extension regarding George Washington Carver. I'm Jackie Green, resource teacher the gifted at Randolph Elementary School, which is also an international baccalaureate primary years program school. So George Washington Carver was one of America's most important botanists. A botanist is somebody who studies plants. He also helped teach American farmers how to successfully grow crops. Today, we're gonna to practice using the critical and creative thinking strategy of encapsulation. Encapsulation is just simply helping you organize your thoughts and focus on the main idea and key words. So some ways to do that are headlines, logos, or simply using a phrase or word. You can also do a personalized license plate. This student did, I love caring and you can use numbers, letters, symbols to show your ideas about yourself or any other topic. 
Here's a logo called Be Kind. I think we've all heard of that one. Simple, but has a really good message. And finally, hashtag never give up. It's kind of a great way to sum up some people or just a philosophy about life. Um, and it might relate to George Washington Carver. You tell me. So let's go ahead and practice. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. So now you're gonna try. I have three stories which have been encapsulated. You need to figure out what story they represent. So let's look at the first one. Eats porridge, meets bears, runs away. What do you think that is? Ooh, good guess. Yes, it was Goldilocks and the Three Bears. What about, can't catch me? Oh, one of my favorites, the gingerbread man. And we all know he gets caught. <laughs> and finally, can't blow my house down. Yep, the three little pigs. Excellent thinking. See how easy it is? Basically, you're going to just think of a word or phrase, and it helps you sort of um, pick up on the main idea or keywords. So we're going to practice that a few times while learning a little bit about George Washington Carver. So one thing that was really important to George Washington Carver um, was being able to go to school. And so he actually left his home to go to a school where African Americans could get a diploma. From there, he went to college and he studied agriculture. Um, he, his professors encouraged him to study agriculture and he was the first student, African American student, to enroll at the Iowa State Agricultural College. After that, he went to Tuskegee College and he became the first African American professor there, helping students learn more about um, agriculture. So let's think about this for a second, based on what you know about George Washington Carver. What are some words or phrases you might use to describe him? Here's one, never stop learning. Clearly that was important to him. Paving the way, he definitely was a trailblazer and helped paved the way for so many other African-Americans. The plant man, because he likes plants. I bet you also had some really good ideas. Keep thinking. So eventually he took his learning and he actually wanted to help farmers by going out into their farms and going out into the field. So he had a bus called the Agricultural School on Wheels, and he would go out into the farms and help them learn about different crops. So he might help them with learning how to plant soybeans, which is the picture on the left, or sweet potatoes, which is in the middle, and peanuts, which is on the right. Um, he's most famous for peanuts, but he helped with so many other agricultural products as well. Next, he became so prominent and so well known for his knowledge about agriculture and specifically about peanuts that he was invited before the members of the House of Representatives to talk a little bit about the peanut. He was so successful in helping pass a law to protect peanuts in the United States um, later on, three American presidents also invited him to come talk and consult with them about learning how to best support agricultural or plant products. He was also an advisor to Mahatma Gandhi, a famous cultural and global leader. So what else did he do? Well, back to peanuts. 
he came up with 325 product ideas for peanuts that included making plastics, paints, dyes, cosmetics, medicine, and additional 75 applications for pecans as well. Because of all of this experimentation, they started calling him the peanut man. But he didn't just work with peanuts. As you know, he also worked with sweet potatoes and other crops. So he came up with another 118 products from um, sweet potatoes, besides obviously just eating them, including molasses, which is a type of syrup, posted stamp glue, flour, vinegar, and synthetic rubber. Finally, I want to talk to you a little bit about this quote from George Washington Carver. I'm going to read it aloud now. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, so aged typically means older or elderly, sympathetic with the striving, striving people that are trying to do their best um, and trying to make a better life for themselves, and tolerant of the weak and strong, because someday in your life, you will have been all of these. I really like that quote. It shows you that he has a lot of empathy and he really um, cares for others. So when he died, this quote, he didn't write it. It was put on his tombstone about George Washington Carver. And I'm going to read that to you now. He could have added fortune to fame, but caring for neither, he found happiness and honor in being helpful to the world. So thinking about those two quotes and everything you know about George Washington Carver, using the strategy of encapsulation, what words or phrases can you think of that would apply to this awesome, innovative man, George Washington Carver? I'm sure you are thinking of some great ideas right now. Here are some possibilities that I came up with. Caring scientists. I wonder if any of you came up with the word caring or scientists. Certainly was. He was innovative, which I mentioned earlier. Innovative means that you come up with new ways and ideas for doing something. Trailblazer. That means you sort of set the path or you're a role model for helping people learn how to do things that have never been done before. And certainly as an African American, he definitely helped set the field um, and pathway for other African Americans to follow as well. And then finally, I put selfless. Selfless means that you think not about yourself as much, but about others and what is helpful for others and the world. So thank you for thinking with me today and practicing that strategy. What are some ideas for how you could use encapsulation later in your life? Well, you could do encapsulation based on a book that you've been reading or pretend that you're turning it into a movie and you have to come up with a tagline um, or a trailer or a poster. You could also just draw a picture or a logo that represents an idea related to any book that you've read lately. One of my favorites, create a personalized learning plate that represents something you find interesting or want to learn more about. And finally, just using words, encapsulate what you know about any topic that you're learning about. It could be something in math, maybe it's plants, maybe it's about writing or a book, um, anything that you've been learning in school or at home. Finally, thank you so much for joining this session with me. Um, I'm really learning a lot as well, and I um, feel like I'm growing as a learner too. 
If you want to share any of your ideas with me directly, you can tag me if you have Twitter at Jackie Green at Randolph Equity. And then you can always use the hashtag at home with APS to share your learning as well. Thank you so much again and have a great rest of your day. See you soon. Hi, my name is Shiara Cherubim. I'm a second grade teacher at Arlington Science Focus School. And I'm happy to be here with you to share the joy of Read Aloud. Read Aloud is my favorite time of the school day because it's a time my children and I come together, we connect, and we enjoy this shared experience of the Read Aloud. There are countless reasons why Read Aloud is a beneficial uh, opportunity for your child to learn and to love reading. I'm going to try and uh, highlight the most important reasons. One is it's an opportunity for us to model fluent reading to our children. So we want to read at a good pace, uh, follow punctuation, and read with expression, which is also going to evoke their interest in, in the books that we read and that they read. And all of this will transfer into their reading experiences and they hopefully will mimic these good habits when they read aloud. Second, it's that we want to grow a love of reading and an appreciation of books. So when we're reading aloud picture books and we're celebrating the pictures and the words or we're picking up a chapter book and maybe even reading and devouring a whole series, um, there's so much to talk about with the print and the pictures of books in our read aloud experiences. Now, children can listen to books at a higher level than they are reading independently. In fact, it's accessible to them and they are going to gain exposure to new vocabulary and to language patterns that they may not even be experiencing or hearing in their day-to-day -day speech or in the day-to-day -day, um, uh, conversations that they're having. In, or, in order for you to think about um, choosing good books, here are some questions you want to be able to answer when you're um, selecting those books. Is this book going to spark good conversation? Is the book relevant to their lives and their culture? Is it going to appeal to them as a reader? It's very often uh, something that I do in the classroom. I try and think of what is going to engage my second graders um, in the book, what genres or uh, what events in the book um, uh, and experiences that the characters are having, will it relate to my children? And then, is this a book that they're going to want to read again? These are all good questions that you might use and think about when choosing your books. Next, I also want to share that if you do not speak English at home as your home language, I encourage you to read books that are representative of your home language because that is going to make the most enriching read aloud experiences in your home. Now, it's not only about the act of reading aloud to your children that it's important. It's about what you do when you're reading aloud to your children. So let me share with you some ways to enrich the experience. As you read aloud, you want to stop to think, uh, think aloud. Share your thoughts as you're reading. And that we do in the classroom using stop and jots. And that's simply taking post-it notes and jotting down after a page, a couple pages, or maybe even a chapter, um, what your questions are, what was surprising to you, what was interesting, new vocabulary. Any ideas that you want to remember are good for stop and jot. And they should be brief. Just. Uh, enough for a post-it note. Making connections to the book is so vital in this experience. Making connections to, from the book to your own life experiences or theirs, or to uh, making connections from the book you're reading to, uh, life, uh, to literature that you've read, other books you've read. And finally, talking about the book, whether it's during the time of read aloud or elsewhere, 
during at the dinner table talking about favorite parts of the book and favorite characters in the book. Really, it's you're going to find that read aloud is going to bring you together and have you have this shared experience, which is so enriching for them. I encourage you to practice read aloud at home um, when you can with your children. And I wish you all the very best. Take care. Hi everyone, my name is Miss Berg and I teach second and third grade at Campbell Elementary. And I'm here today for our at home with APS math lesson in my home with my dog Zoe. And we are hoping that fractions can help us with a situation we have at our house every once in a while. So sometimes we walk down to the bakery in Sherlington called Best Buns and we get a special treat for Zoe. And it looks like this. That's a huge ginormous dog biscuit. It is almost as big as her head. It's huge. So um, when we get home, I cut it into smaller pieces uh, because she can't really eat that whole thing in a day. That wouldn't be good for her. So sometimes I cut it into two equal pieces and they're halves. And sometimes I cut it into four equal pieces and they look like this and they're fourths. I'm hoping that our math lesson today can help me decide which way is better by thinking about comparing fractions. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start today's lesson with the number sense routine, same but different. In this routine, we look at two pictures and we decide what's the same about them and what's different about them. So I have two pictures of pizza and your job is to say what's the same and what's different. You might use words like parts, whole, circle, half, fourth, eighth, size, amount, larger, or smaller. So what do you think? What is the same and what is different? Let's hear from some kids at Campbell about what they see that's the same and that's different. I think that the parts are like, both. they're both triangles. Oh, well, yeah. They both have the same toppings is the same. The left one is um, a larger amount amount than the um, the right one. The learning target for today's lesson is I can compare unit fractions. And you might be wondering, what is a unit fraction? Unit fractions are one part of a fraction, a fraction where one is the numerator. So here are some examples of unit fractions. Each one has equal parts and only one is shaded in. These are also some examples of unit fractions. They all have one in the numerator, the number on top. Another important word in that learning target was compare, and we can use words and symbols to compare. You can compare the numbers 57 and 23 with words and symbols. Here's 57 and 23. You might put this symbol between them. And that tells us that 57 is greater than 23. Here's another example, 45 and 82. You would put this symbol in between them. And that tells us that 45 is less than 82. I bet you know what symbol's coming next. If I have two numbers that are the same, I use this symbol. And that says that 31 is equal to 31. We can use those same symbols, is less than, greater than, or equal to, to compare fractions. So let's go ahead and get started. Take a look at these juice glasses. What do you notice about them? I have one that's filled one-eighth of the way to the top, 
Another is one fourth of the way to the top. And the last one is one half of the way to the top. Now, I'm wondering, and I bet lots of kids are wondering too, if eight is the biggest number on the screen right now, how come that is the juice glass with the smallest amount of juice in it? That has to do with the denominator of the fraction. The denominator is the part of the fraction that tells us how many equal parts there are. Here I have a set of fraction models. One whole, one half, one third, one fourth, one sixth, and one eighth. You might be noticing that the denominators, the numbers on the bottom of the fractions, are getting bigger. And as the denominator gets bigger, the equal pieces get smaller. It's all about sharing. I have two people who are sharing this pizza. Let's pretend that circle's a pizza. And each one of them gets one half, which is a pretty big part of the whole pizza. But I have eight people over here and they're going to share the same size pizza as those two people. And each one of them is going to get a much smaller piece because eighths mean that eight people are sharing it equally. The more people who are sharing something equally, the smaller the amount that each person gets. So we can compare fractions with pictures or models that show us what the fraction looks like. For example, if I want to know which is bigger, one eighth or one third, these pictures help a lot to let me see how many equal parts there are and how big each one is. If I want to know which one is bigger, it's definitely one third. Here's another one. Which is greater, one third or one sixth? That's right, it's one third. It's much bigger than one sixth because fewer people are sharing that whole. Which of these is smaller, one fourth or one half? Yep, one fourth is smaller than one half. And which of these is less, one half or one eighth? You got it, one eighth is much smaller than one half. Let's combine that practice with those comparison symbols that we talked about earlier and those comparison words. So let's compare these two fractions. What would we call them? That's right, we have one third and one sixth. What symbol should we put between them? You got it. We would use this symbol and say one third is greater than one sixth. How about these two models? I have one eighth and one half. What symbol should we put between them? Exactly. And we would say one eighth is less than one half. Here are two rectangular models, one sixth and one half. The symbol looks like this, and how should we say it? Right, one sixth is less than one half. One more practice. I've got one sixth and one eighth. They look a lot alike. The denominators can help you. If one sixth means six people are sharing the whole, and one eighth means eight people are sharing the whole, well, the six people are going to get a little bit bigger pieces. And we would say one sixth is greater than one eighth. You got it. The learning target for this lesson was I can compare unit fractions. How are you feeling about that? Can you help me use that scale for my dog treat example? 
I can cut this whole dog treat into halves or into fourths. How could you compare one fourth of the dog treat to one half of the dog treat? What symbols and words could you use? That's right, we would use this symbol and say one fourth is less than one half. Great work. So if I'm thinking about whether I should do fourths or halves, my dog might not like the fourths because they are smaller pieces, but she'd be pretty happy because there are more pieces, so the treat would last her longer. Whereas if I cut the treats into halves, the pieces are bigger, which she would love, but there are fewer pieces, so the treat will only last her for two days instead of four. Let's reflect on this lesson. Imagine you have a cookie in front of you. Would you rather have one third of the cookie or one sixth of the cookie? Why? Share your reason with a family member. You might use words to describe your thinking like greater than, less than, pieces, whole, smaller, or larger. This week's family math tip is all about ways to extend um, and build children's conceptual understanding of comparing fractions. So comparing unit fractions with visual representations, which is what we do in second grade, is pretty straightforward, but the skills get more advanced pretty quickly by the time you get to fifth grade, you're doing really impressive comparing fractions with decimals and we want kids to be ready for that by really understanding what fractions are all about. That's what we want to build in second grade. So one thing that you can do that will help is to just relate fractions that you see to one half. So are they greater than one half, less than one half, maybe even equal to one half? So if you take these cards that were in the family math packet and you can just look at one of them, name it. This is one eighth and it's definitely less than one half. So you can talk about that. You could talk about how many more parts would need to be shaded in to get to one half, things like that. You could say that this one, four fifths, is more than one half. And in fact, it's almost one whole. If you want to add to this benchmark situation, one half is a great benchmark to start with. You could also talk about close to zero and close to one. And your kids might be ready for the idea of equivalent fractions. So three sixths is the same as one half. And that equivalent fraction, especially with one half, is the kind that second graders start to notice. You could also talk about relating things to one half in terms of things in your life. So I'm reading my class this book aloud, and I'm about, you can see, I'm about halfway done with it. Um, I was eating this clementine with my breakfast, but I ate less than half of it. And my coffee cup is definitely less than halfway full right now. So just in your daily life, you can relate things to one half. The other tip that I have at school, kids love these fraction circles and they also have like fraction pieces or tiles. I know you don't have these at home, I totally understand that, but there are some great websites that have virtual versions of these manipulatives, and students at this age really love to just explore with those and notice things like maybe they might notice that 3 6 is equivalent to 1 half when they are playing around with them. You could also make your own set at home. So I took some, I just took a plastic up and I drew some circles. And then from there, your kids can cut them out. And I use scrap paper. Your kids can cut them out and then um, figure out how to partition them into the different sized pieces. So I have some here. I did one in fourths. So I split it into fourths, the, the circle. And then I cut them all out and colored them. You could make eighths. And I've got, oh, I've got a half right here. So you can make a whole set of fraction circles. I made one circle halves, one circle fourths, one circle eighths. You could go into thirds and sixths, and the kids really enjoy playing with those. Plus making them would also help build that 
foundational understanding of fractions. And you could do the same thing with rectangular pieces of paper and make um, fraction pieces like these. So, hope you enjoy exploring fractions at home, and we really thank you for joining us this week on At Home with APS. As we end this episode of At Home with APS, we hope that you enjoyed seeing APS teachers and staff bringing literacy instruction into your own home. Maybe you even got to see one of your very own teachers that you worked with during the school year. I'm sure that was really exciting for you. So we invite you, parents and families, to continue to take videos and pictures of how you are engaging in literacy activities while at home. Be sure to tag us on whatever social media outlet you prefer using the hashtag at home with APS. And we look forward to seeing all the exciting and creative ways APS students and families are engaging with literacy while at home. And who knows, maybe you can make a special guest appearance on at home with APS. Speaking of which, check out this dedicated APS student as she practices hearing all of the sounds in the word box. Uh, um, Until our next early literacy episode, we ask that you stay safe, stay healthy Arlington, and we look forward to seeing you again soon for our next edition of At Home with APS.